I think what we'll do now is I will turn it over to Nora. I actually, um, Nora and I talked a bit about the about where we where what 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 things we have not um, covered and asked me what I thought. And one area that I thought would be interesting and that Nora and I have agreed <clears throat> that we will make it make the focus this time is this. So I, I wrote out in a somewhat formal way the question that I wanted to um, to raise. Uh, I wrote it in the uh, in the blog. Um, and it has to do with the intellectual legacy of the work that Nora <clears throat> has been talking about. So uh, as I put it to her, one thing that I thought she might tackle would be to assess progress on Maya grammar and lexicon as it has been affected by the specific contributions that have arisen as a result of, of your whole program. Um, so what uh, was discovered or learned as a result of the uh, grammars that were written in the 1990s by native speaker linguists, and then by the work done by uh, your, uh, your Nora's students from that era, and also by, uh, by uh, graduate students who got their PhDs here in linguistics who were native speakers of Maya languages. And this group includes Balam Mateo Toledo, Juan Jesus Vasquez, Telma Khan, and Jaime Perez Gonzalez who many of you guys know, maybe you guys don't know some of the earlier folks um, and uh, work that's been done by them uh, and by you in conjunction with them. Um, so if you like, you could contrast um, the uh, work that's been accomplished by them uh, with a baseline um, that might be defined by your own original mom grammar from the 1970s um, plus what uh, has been contributed by non-Maya scholars, such as Terry Kaufman, Roberta Savala, Tom Larson, Rusty Barrett, Judith Asin, Jessica Kuhn, Robert Henderson, Ryan Bennett, and Danny, uh, among others. Um, in other words, what in what ways has the work of Maya linguists made things different in the field as a whole in comparison to what might have been uh, what it might have been like uh, had it been only non-Maya linguists based on what we know from their work. Um, another way to answer this would be to look at Maya linguistics in comparison to a field where there have been relatively fewer native speaker linguists such as Muscogean or Algonquian or Tupian or Chibchan. So Nora, <coughs> I'll turn it over to you. Um, okay, uh, I don't know which parts of this I'm gonna be able to really um, effectively address, but I'll do my best. The, um, the, and the first thing to put it all in context is that we're talking about a pretty long period. Um, I started working on Mayan languages in the 70s and wrote the grammar that um, Tony is talking about for publication in the early 80s. And we have uh, grammars written by speakers of five Mayan languages that were published in the 90s. And another um, set of, of, of uh, three grammars that was written by speakers of Mayan languages who were writing about languages that they did not speak, however, in the 2000, uh, around 2010. So we're, we're talking overall about 40 or 50 years of, of publication and change in terms of what people were addressing um, in, their, in their grammars. And so the changes that were going on were not only the changes that you could talk about as being due to whether they were native speakers addressing this issue or non-native speakers, there were also lots of changes in the field. So um, I'd say that when I started to write and I was contemporary with um, John Daly who wrote a grammar of Tutuhil and I uh, preceded by several years, uh, Tom Larson who wrote a grammar and um, a grammar of Quiche, 
um, and we all followed slightly on on James Munlock, who wrote another grammar of Quiche, a different sort of grammar of Quiche. And I would say that the major change that had gone on by then, say, say the grammars that John Daly and I wrote in the early 80s, was that we included quite a lot of syntax. And in the uh, in, in descriptive and uh, uh, grammars preceding that time, they were almost invariably um, phonology morphology and no syntax at all or the syntax was cleverly disguised as morphology. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I know there were some linguists of the period who thought there wasn't, quote, any syntax in some language that they happened to be working on when in fact it was, there was syntax of course, but it was, um, the, but the languages, since a lot of the American languages have a very robust morphology, um, the, this business of disguising syntax as morphology was able to take place. And there were some people, including my advisor, so I know about this firsthand, who really thought that they were not dealing with syntax when they were dealing with um, complicated morphology. Now, of course, we have another term that we use for some of this. It's called morphosyntax, right? And um, so we get it all in with that term. And, and I think everybody knows that a lot of what you're looking at when you look at morphology is in fact syntax when you're working with a language that has a lot of morphology at least. And so we wouldn't make the same mistake of trying to claim that there's quote, no syntax in whatever language we're working on. But the fact remains that people, even if they did recognize that there was syntax in some of these languages, um, didn't didn't pay much attention to it. They the, the grammars before the eighties were some of them were um, very um, were were quite detailed, but, but just in um, phonology and morphology. And so that there was a, including a fair amount of syntax made a very large change in these grammars. John Daly. And I both probably had at least half of our grammar, our grammar, our respective grammars devoted to syntax specifically. And, um, uh, and so this was different, okay? So that's a change that was going on in the writing of grammars, no matter who was writing them. Now to go on to the, what was going on when you had um, speakers who were, native speakers of these various languages writing the grammars rather than simply having um, outsiders. Uh, well, there's some very interesting things I think that have, have gone on. And one is that the writing of grammars, it kept changing and it kept becoming more and more robust. And I would say that it was especially becoming more robust in the area of syntax and morphosyntax. So these are the areas that had not been as well developed before the 80s and were continued to be developed in the 80s and subsequently. So they kept on being part of what a good grammar would include would be a, a very, very healthy um, chunk of syntax that would be related at least to the morphology and possibly to the phonology as well depending on the language. So people paid a lot more attention to, to syntax in general. The native speakers who got their PhDs and, um, and wrote about, about their own languages included the four people that Tony mentioned that got their PhDs at Texas. And that was um, Balam Mateo, Juan Jesus Vasquez, Telma Khan and Jaime Perez. And Balam and Telma and Jaime all chose not to write grammars. They chose to write very large and very complicated works on, on specific grammatical problems rather than whole grammars. Juan Jesus did write a grammar of Chol 
but um, Balam worked on complex predicates, sorry. And um, Telma worked on complement clauses and Jaime worked on alignment. So these are all uh, very important, sort of very modern topics. The uh, complex predicates has not been worked on by anybody else for still for Mayan languages. Um, quite a few people have worked on complement clauses, but very few people have written it up in the kind of detail that Tama did. And while lots and lots and lots of linguists have worked on alignment one way or another, Jaime found a new kind of alignment that had not been formally described to work on. And so, um, uh, it, and so this was something in alignment that was, was, was new, even though the topic was old and pretty, pretty well covered. I would say that all of these works, including the grammar by Juan Jesus, was, were, were, um, were really magnificent contributions to the study of specific topics, or in the case of Juan Jesus, a whole grammar of Mayan languages. And the, um, it's not that these kinds of specific topics hadn't been addressed before, but they were being addressed in very sophisticated ways by people for whom the grammar itself was no challenge, right? They spoke these languages and they could, well, maybe describing it properly could be a challenge. They certainly knew what they were, they knew what they were describing. They knew how it worked and they could, of course, as we all know, native speakers can grab um, examples that are out of thin air or their ears or wherever they come from and don't have to go and do, you know, a month's worth of field work to answer certain kinds of questions. So they had that tr tremendous advantage. And, and that I think enabled people to work on the kinds of complex to topics that have been rarely worked on before, although they are increasingly worked on by both speakers and non-speakers. So that some of the other people that Tony mentioned have also worked on um, uh, complex top topics and I would, uh, in syntax in, in particular, and I would of course um, uh, single out uh, Judith Asen among that group of people, especially because um, she's always worked in syntax, not in general grammar. And she has been um, one of the people who has been exceedingly careful in her work and has therefore done work that is um, very useful to lots and lots of other people. It's, it's very trustworthy among other things, but it's also gone deeper and farther than a lot of other work. Plus which Judith Asen has taught about syntax and about uh, of, of Mayan languages and of Mesoamerican languages in general to a wide variety of speakers of these languages. And she has found that teaching speakers um, has been, you know, particularly um, interesting and, and fun. And so she's, uh, once she got into that, she did, quite, she's done quite a lot of it and has been working um, on all kinds of things, including uh, complement clauses, relative clauses, um, alignment, um, focus and topic, and, and similar kinds of, of, of of uh, syntactic topics. Judith has the great advantage of being theoretical, but not, but not, um, not wedded to a theory without rethinking it. She's very eclectic in her theoretical approaches. She has used a bunch of different theoretical approaches, and she's perfectly willing to to ditch one and go on to another if the one she happens to be working with doesn't seem to work too well or to do certain kinds of combinations. And so that's been, I think, very useful for syntax and especially the syntax of Mesoamerican languages and Mayan languages in particular. The um, other people that have been mentioned, well, let's see, Tom Larson wrote the, one of the, the best grammars of a Mayan language that I've ever seen, but he combined that, it was of Quiche, he combined that with an awful lot of, um, of straight syntax. So it, it was his grammar, his dissertation was titled something about ergativity and quiche. And so he, he went into the whole, the whole question of ergative 
uh, languages more, more than you might in uh, just a regular grammar. Okay, the, um, well, that is, we know, um, Kaufman worked on historical linguistics as does Danny, but Danny is open about his work and is also very, very interested in language contact in particular, which means that he's making some very, um, some really new contributions um, in a field in which a lot of people have not worked at language, looked at language contact among related languages, which is one of the things that he in particular looks at. And then, um, and then we have a few other people here. Now, Roberto Savala, what he did in, for my end is he wrote a, a, a very nice grammar, but his more recent work has been on Nihesoke languages. So although I certainly think he is a Mayanist and he wrote a grammar, he's, and he follows all of the theoretical contributions. He is not himself um, doing quite as much on Mayan as he does on Nihesoke. Okay, so what is the, where does this bring us to? It brings us to, we've got a bunch of people who are not speakers of the languages, who are doing some very good work on grammar in general and syntax in particular. So after the 80s, the new thing in all, probably in all um, documentary and descriptive work is, is including syntax in, in the work. And for those of you who are starting off, I don't know, it may be surprising for you to think that there was a time not too long ago when people just didn't even look at syntax. And I you know, came right out of that period and was in fact even encouraged not to look at syntax by my advisor who was one of the sort of non-believers. And there, there is no syntax in this language. Well, um, that's not, as you know, possible. It's, it's, it, syntax is a universal category, but what is possible is to figure out how it works in different languages. And since it was an open field back when I started, it was a great field to go into. There are people who are now going back and looking at, uh, at for instance, phonology and finding new things and, and, and to, to work on there. But it, it, it's really the case that syntax had not been particularly looked at. So the Mayas who have been getting PhDs are inheritors of this same wide open field. And so it should be no surprise to you that they've all been working in syntax, all of them. Um, and even if they do grammars, they, those, the grammars are much more re robust in syntax than they have been in the past. And for those of them who got PhDs, three quarters didn't just do grammars, they did specific um, analytical problems in syntax. The other thing that Mayas who have been writing about their own languages have done is they've written really good grammars. They've written, um, there were five grammars in the, in the 90s and uh, three more grammars that were written in the in the 2000s um, that were reference grammars of, so that's eight different languages. And, and Mayan linguistics didn't have any reference grammars before that, um, not really. So these are, they're con contrib contributing um, reference grammars, which uh, to my mind are for their time were very, um, um, are, were or are very, very good reference grammars. They, among other things, devote a lot of space from one third to, to even more to syntax, which had not been included previously, as I said. They are, um, they could be improved on all of them because people know more now and there's other topics that could be added so it's, it's like, I don't know, this is a field that's always growing and you can always do more. And so um, these grammars, which I think are excellent reference grammars can all be, could all be modernized and brought up to date. And there's more problems that could be addressed and problems that people have worked on and made some, some very good um, contributions to. So I don't wanna say any more that these are the last word in grammars because they're not. And even the ones from the 2000s, which are considerably more um, up to date than the ones from the from the 90s, um, are already, you know, failing to cover all of the topics that we now know something about. 
And the, the, the um, I guess the message there is that grammar writing is changing very rapidly in these days. And so when you write a full grammar, I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't write a grammar. I think you should write a grammar if, if your language lacks one, but you're, it's not, don't expect it to be a reference for, you know, forever after. It's going to be a reference for about 10 years. And then more stuff will have been done and people will know more and they'll be writing, you know, the, the next very substantial, very solid reference grammar. If you have a lot of data in yours and a lot of good examples, you should cover the ground pretty well. So, so besides looking at specialized topics in syntax, uh, speakers of Mayan languages have very much, have made very um, big contributions just to grammar writing um, and have, have written eight plus the dissertation by Juan Jesus. So that makes nine really, really good standard reference grammars. These are grammars that are in terms of page length, um, 450 pages and up. So they're pretty, they're, they're pretty robust. Um, Danny? Yeah, there, just, just a little note on that. To also think about the impact. Eight of those nine are also written in Spanish. And right. I, I think that is uh, significant as well for, for kind of the advancement of the, of the field. Yes, um, thanks for mentioning that. I hadn't even recalled that that was an issue. Um, eight of the nine are written in Spanish because Spanish is the lengua franca of the region where Mayan languages are spoken. And so that the people who were writing the, these grammars, even if they were um, uh, even if they were bilingual in English and Spanish as well as, as speakers of their own languages, chose to write in Spanish because that is the lengua franca of the region. And I think that is really, really important. It means that other Mayas, whether they have the kind of education that enables them to speak English or not, um, can read these works and use them. If they were written in English, as the dissertations have had to be, they are not available to the, to the, the wider population. I would like to say that um, Telma Khan took uh, many of the major points in her, um, in her work, which was about uh, complement clauses and rewrote them in Spanish and has published a book in Spanish about uh, complement clauses in Quiche. Um, so she's the only one who rewrote her, her, her dissertation in, or, or big a big chunk of her dissertation in Spanish. And eight of the nine full grammars are in Spanish. Um, I think this is completely appropriate and I have no, no problems with that at all. Anybody who wants to work on a Mayan language has who is not a Spanish speaker has to learn Spanish. So, so my attitude about all of this is that um, if you need to work on a Mayan language, you need to learn Spanish and the, the eight of nine grammars that are written in Spanish will then be available to you. Christian. Uh, yeah, related to the language we actually use for writing our work, that is you know, for population that are reading in Spanish, and this is a question for you, but also for the other, uh, you know, teachers, professor here in the department. Uh, I've been thinking if maybe, you know, a way to contribute a little bit more um, effectively, the language uh, like Spanish, for example, would be allowed to, for example, submit the dissertation. So then the work will be useful for, you know, people who don't read in English necessarily, right? And for community members. Well, let me tell you, Christian, um... The graduate school will allow dissertations to be written in Spanish. However, they have a very, very difficult bar that you have to pass in order to, to write your, your dissertation in some language other than English. And that is that you have a publication contract in hand for the version in this other language. And that is something that you know, before you've even written your dissertation, it's going to be really hard to obtain. 
So it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to get approval for writing your dissertation in another language. Now, we could, with if anybody wants to uh, try it, we could make arguments for for uh, accepting a dissertation in Spanish uh, that don't in, in, include a publication contract in hand, um, but would would rely on a, a vague promise of publication in the future, probably, because mm. obviously if you're gonna write it in Spanish to make it more available to people, then it has to be, you have to have say something about publication in terms of what that availability consists of. But as we all know, things circulate these days without actual be, actually being published. I mean, once you have your dissertation written, it's gonna circulate among the, um, uh, in the community, even if it's not published because it's gonna circulate online. So it's, uh, well, so anyway, I, 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 so Tony says, or an argument along the lines you just gave accessibility to speakers into the regional community. Right, we can, I, we can make all these arguments, but I have no confidence that they will be listened to, so. Um, I mean, that, that was the argument that was attempted for, for Danielle Smith, right? That's right. His, for his grammar Daniel's, of Kuna, which should tried. have been written in Spanish. It, it, th there was every logical, rational reason why it, it was should have been written in Spanish and they wouldn't allow it, so. Right. And, 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 the, and the interesting thing about Danielle's dissertation is that Danielle's fully, um, uh, a fu a fully confident, competent speaker of English. So um, I think they always think that anybody who wants to write it in Spanish, you know, they want to do that because they don't really speak English very well. And that was not the case with Danielle. He had no more difficulty writing in English than in Spanish. Um, but he was, he was denied. Now, of course, there'd be probably a different dean in that office, and we could make the arguments more strongly for somebody but, um, than, we, than we did back then. But the, the point is that it's hard to make those arguments, and I, I wouldn't be willing to guarantee um, that they would be successful. But we can try. If anybody wants to, to try to argue to write your dissertation in Spanish because of accessibility to the speaker, community and to the um, non-speaker local community. We can, we can try to do that argument, but, uh, but don't be surprised if you get turned down. Um, okay, so let's see, what else? Um, and what uh, Tony has been asking, in what ways has the work of linguists or Mayas made things different in the field as a whole um, in comparison to what have, they might've been like if only non-Maya linguists um, have worked in the field. Um, I, I don't know whether that's really, that's really hard to answer, frankly. I mean, the whole food, the whole field was moving and the people who wrote about things in their dissertations or in the, the grammars um, were moving with it. What you can see numerically is that lots more grammars were written by non-Mayas than by, by Mayas than by non-Mayas. Uh, so there are eight of them, nine of them. And, and if we count up all the grammars that were written by other people, I don't think it, it's gonna reach nine. Um, so people have been interested in, you know, in having what is considered to be one of the basic documentary tools, a grammar. I would say that the ones who have, the people who have gone to graduate school at least have been very up to date on linguistic theory and the kinds of, of um, the kinds of problems that people work on. So I don't know that that would have been any different for a non-Maya versus a Maya audience, but it certainly has been a good model that the, those dissertations are all of them, I think, very good. And um, not to say that those, the dissertations that non-Mayas have written are not very good, although there's one or two out there that were not mentioned in the material that Tony um, put together that were um, not very good. What else could I say that 
have made these grammars different, um, or not grammars, but the work of, of Maya's different from other people. Well, there's a certain, there's certainly a little more authority involved, right? You know, people are speaking when they're when they are writing about their own languages. Um, you can be pretty sure that what they're saying about their own languages is is accurate. Um, and so I I'd, I'd say in general they're more authoritative, and people are both able to and are willing to write um, about very, very current topics. Tony. It seems to me that um, in certain areas, the selection of topics and certain kinds of topics, uh, you could point to uh, uh, some things. I'll give you two examples. So one is Jaime um, Perez Gonzalez's uh, master's thesis, which was about um, uh, idiophones in uh, in uh, Tzeltal. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an area that whose interest uh, I think is likely to be very prominent for a person who's a native speaker who basically um, lives the language and, um, and, and uh, something to which that they, they would have um, excessive, Accessible that would be accessible to them um, because they sort of know of the ubiquity of these kinds of features in speech, and so I can't but think that that's a uh, uh, a kind of unique uh, example. Another one, I may be kind of mixing people up, but I remember there was a really nice paper at one of the conferences we had here, and I think it was by Romelia um, uh, uh, about positional um, positional roots in Maya languages. There are lots of positional roots and they have very, very nuanced meanings. And uh, I remember it was just a really excellent paper that uh, looked at them um, in terms of their, their kind of paradigmatic semantics, but also in terms of the kinds of, of, of formations that they occurred in. So um, that would be two examples. Okay, and I think that they're they're excellent examples. These are both um, they both happen to be lexical examples. Mm -hmm. And um, Jaime w did something that nobody else has ever done when they're looking at what they call either idiophones or expressive words, or in Mayan languages, particularly affect words for some reason that is uh, opaque to me. And um, except that affect means emotion, but whatever. Um, he looked at gesture, co-speech gesture with these things. And that was, I think, really important. And nobody had ever done it as far as I know. Um, so he was adding a whole new dimension. And um, that, was, that was, besides the fact that his work was very detailed and, and really covered um, many, many, many of these critters. He, he looked at them in a different way. Okay, the, um, the, the paper on positionals. Well, it, first of all, R Romelio was not the first person to look at that. Um, Nick Tay and um, Talma looked at positionals in Quiche quite a bit um, before when Romelia did, and I thought at the time that their paper about positionals was about the best paper I'd ever heard on positionals, even though they followed up on a whole dissertation done by a non-speaker of Mayan languages, which was quite good, but, but nonetheless wasn't um, as, as detailed as Nikte and, and, and Telma's. And then Romelia, I think, looked at the these things with respect to the glyphs is that right Danny yeah yeah she she looked specifically at the glyphs and tied it into iconography and and some comparative morphology stuff and and kind of remarkably I don't know whether I should uh, I'll, I'll I'll leave any names out of it but uh, someone actually came up after her talk and said oh you're all wrong this is the way that it is and had presented their own sort of theory, just with this this kind of 
idea that somehow she'd gotten it all wrong. But but in fact, what what happened, and especially with Nikte's and and Telma's work, I think is that um, there had been a tradition of just glossing over complexity, and that was not acceptable to people that were aware of how much complexity there was there. And so, and so there, so looking at this was uh, a big break from tradition in that sense. Right. And so both Nick Tay and Telma's paper and Romelia's work were, were es eschewing, you know, the simplification of all of this stuff. And so then they came up with something that somebody or other said, oh, that's all wrong. But yeah. Because it I was mean, much more complex than that person, I suppose, was expecting. Yeah, even the stuff with secondary predicates, I think that was another aspect of the, the syntax of Mayan languages that I, I see that as, as deriving from contributions from native speakers of different languages um, being trained in linguistics and saying, oh, wait a second, you're saying that these are adjectives? They're not, they're not adjectives. They're, they're syntactically functioning differently than that. Right. So that so then I think all of these are examples of the fact that uh, that people looking at their own languages were able to see complexities that outsiders had not, in fact, noted before. And while we certainly believe that all of us who are not speakers of the languages we work on can note these these features. The fact of the matter is that, at least in, with Mayan as an example, a lot of people hadn't noted some of the really, um, the really, some of these really remarkable features that that fed into the lexicon, and 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 speakers of Mayan languages did. So that would be um, certainly an argument for native speakers of these languages to work on them is that they they um, are, they're able to see certain kinds of, of complexity that other people don't see, period. I mean, it's just, it's just part of the, part of the, um, part of the work to see that kind of complexity. It does get a little bit tricky to say, is, or is that complexity something that was noted because, um, because you know, Telma or Balam speak a uh, Mayan language natively, or just because they're really good linguists? Uh, you know, what do you attribute it to? Uh, but I, either way, you know, it's clear that that was a contribution coming from them. Yeah, and. Um... And, and, and you have to say, okay, but, and it's a contribution that's coming from speakers of the languages working in conjunction with people who are not speakers. For instance, their advisors, by and large, um, are not at least native speakers of these languages. And, um, uh, and it's, been very, it's been very fruitful is the point. And, and, that, and that, has, that has been very important. I don't wanna, I think neither Danny nor I would wanna be careful not to over, not to over attribute, um, you know, great new discoveries to the fact that somebody's a speaker of the language. And the fact of the matter is that there have been some new, new discoveries. And what with people uh, working in conjunction with changes that are going on in linguistics and also working on their own languages um, with a very, very substantial descriptive base done by other people, they've been able to move on. And w whether it's because they're speakers, whether it's because they've had better base material or whether it's because they are able to um, uh, take advantage of, of, of advances in theory and apply them to their own languages in ways that other people didn't have the opportunity to do. I don't know, but it's all, it's all, work, it's all been working out pretty well. And I don't wanna claim one cause there. Somebody have any other, as something else you would like to think about or like me to think about or, or talk about in this, in this discussion? I mean, I've, I've certainly always found 
that working with Mayas on their own languages seems, seems productive. It seems fruitful. It seems like, um, it seems like we all have a good time working on this stuff. And, um, and the people who are learning to work on it are having a really good time too. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you, when you think of, oh, linguistics is hard and this is really hard work and I'm really, you know, I'm getting tired of it. Well, I don't know, these guys don't get tired of it and they don't think it's too hard. Tony. I think in, uh, another person's work that might um, sort of feed in here in an in interesting way is that of Rusty Barrett. Um, Rusty Barrett has uh, uh, wrote a grammar of Sipa Capense uh, Maya as his dissertation, but he also um, has had a very strong interest in verbal art of various kinds, um, including written poetry in, in Maya languages. And I really think that the um, uh, that so so one argument might be that you know if you're a native speaker you start so you see these you know these kind of more nuanced aspects of language but it's also really interesting to look at the dialogue that develops with somebody like Rusty who comes along from the outside and takes an interest for whatever reason in that kind of expressivity and um, the way that that bounces off of people who are speakers of languages and again this is so i'm asking this because i don't actually know what kind of bouncing um uh, rusty's work has led to but i thought perhaps I might uh, enlighten this conversation well i mean rusty's the one who's been doing the bouncing rusty's been working with um mayan speakers speakers of mayan languages who are producing poetry right now before you know, our very eyes. And in particular, he's been working with a lot of um, songwriters and, um, and some people who write, uh, you know, uh, non-sung non, non poetry. And, uh, and, you know, he got, he got interested in these topics here at UT. So this is more of an advertisement for, for uh, the fact that things like verbal art have been part of the program here than it is uh, an argument for uh, any specific um, developments that are due to either being Maya or not being Maya. Um, I don't know of, I do know of some people, some Mayas who are working on poetry. So far, I don't find that work particularly convincing. I mean, it may be fine as work on poetry, but it, it, it has nothing to do with language because these are Mayas who are not speakers of Mayan languages who are working on poetry. So they have no advantage there. Just in light of um, the questions about changes in grammar writings and the impacts and implications of uh, works done by native Mayan speakers, I just wanted to ask specifically about if, if there have been any changes or any works of of grammars being written in the native languages, in Mayan languages, um, and ask what the implications there might be for technical linguistic language uh, development in native Mayan languages, and also what the implications of this might be in relationship to what you've talked about, Nora, earlier about intellectual justice and linguistic independence uh, for many of these uh, communities. Um, well, I think the answer is yes, that people have been begun to be writing um, in Maya about the grammars of Mayan languages. This has primarily been in attempts to write school materials, so it's not a, an extremely um, uh, high level of grammar writing, but it, there are some grammars being written, and what people are doing about the language and so on is they're, they're making it up as they go. Um, Mayas have been very concerned for some years now, I'd say 20 or 30 years with um, neologisms and trying to get back, you know, um, uh, technical terminology from Spanish, the, the idea that you have to rely on an external language for all technical uh, vocabulary has been, you know, kind of grating on people's nerves, so they've been trying to make up words in Mayan languages to take care of a lot of the technical vocabulary. And some of that is linguistic, the technical linguistic vocabulary. So there's been some work on that. And 
uh, I've seen a couple of examples of school grammars that where, where the writing is entirely in the Mayan language. How successful these are, I don't know. I can't tell yet. And it would take a, a good deal of, of testing of the, of the pieces and in the schools and to see whether they work or not. Um, but you have to start somewhere with all of this kind of process. And if, if you get so that you wanna not rely on a particular language for all of your technical vocabulary, I, I, don't, I don't mind that too much myself since I'm a speaker of English where pretty much 99.9% uh, .9 of our technical vocabulary does come from other languages. And so I don't see it as a real disadvantage, but lots and lots of other people who speak other languages in the world do see it as a disadvantage. They see it as, as something that is, when all your, when all your vocabulary or comes, all your technical vocabulary comes from, some other language, they see it as a kind of, of uh, uh, it, it somehow is a, a negative comment about the language, that the language can't even handle all of this kind of technical matter. Like I said, when you speak a language where 99% of the vocabulary does come from another language, you, you, you lose your sensitivity to this issue. But it is a major, issue of sensitivity among, I think probably, I would guess most indigenous languages in the Americas, that they don't want to have a ton of borrowings from Spanish or English or whatever. Um, they wanna have words that come from their own languages. And so people have been working on that. And that means that when they write in uh, their own language about grammar, they, they by and large can write in that language without the intervention of a lot of external vocabulary. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's in some ways testing the whole idea of being able to, um, to have technical, technical vocabulary that is not uh, being borrowed. Um, what people have by and large done to create such vocabulary is they've used the, 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 morph, the morphological resources that are that are available for, for building words. Thank you, Nora. That's a really nice, uh, nice. Addendum uh, to the prior. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Nora.